Let's continue. While Don Quixote vacillates between imitating more Roland or more Amadis, our heroes arrive at the foot of a tall mountain where there is a gentle stream with a meadow so green and lush that it pleased the eyes. The theme of the pastoral locus amenus again. Don Quixote exclaims aloud as if out of his mind, by heaven, this is the place. And while he describes the site as if it were populated by mythological creatures invoking a number of nymphs and wanton and lascivious satyrs, he again refers to the overarching theme of jealousy. Here the complaints of this unhappy lover whom a long absence and imagined jealousies have brought to a state of lament among this wilderness, complaining of the rigid condition of that ungrateful and beautiful one, limit and apex of all human beauty. O Dulcinea of Toboso, day of my night, glory of my grief, north of my travels, star of my fortunes. At this key moment, right when Don Quixote is about to undertake his so rare, so happy, and so never before seen penance, and right when Sancho is about to leave to report all of this to Dulcinea, it occurs to our Hidalgo to remove Rocinante's bit and saddle. Slapping him on his rear, he proclaims, Liberty is given you by he who is without her. As we saw in the case of Rocinante and the Galician mares after Marcela's complaint, since Don Quixote is preparing to strip naked himself, there is a clear symbolic connection between the knight and his mount. More importantly, perhaps, this gesture from Don Quixote reminds Sancho of his ass, now officially lost for the first time in the first edition. God speed to the one who saved us the work of unsaddling my gray, for by my faith he wouldn't lack slaps to give him, nor things to say in his praise. But then the squire recognizes a serious problem. How will he get to El Toboso? So he suggests to Don Quixote that we'll do well to resaddle Rocinante to make up for the absence of my gray, because it will save me time both going and returning, because if I walk, I don't know when I'll arrive nor when I'll get back, because in short, I don't walk very well. A little later, when he begs Don Quixote not to hurt himself, the Hidalgo replies, it will be necessary for you to leave me some lint bandages to heal my wounds, because fate has had it that we are without the balsam that we lost. And Sancho refers again to his lost ass. A greater loss was the ass, for with it we lost the bandages and everything. At the same time, note the forceful return of the theme of religious orthodoxy. First, throughout the chapter, phrases like initial dispositions, las generales, punishment of those who relapse, pena de relasos, and adjudicated matter, cosa juzgada, all allude to the legal rhetoric of the Inquisition. Second, Master and squire actually debate whether the place Don Quixote has chosen to do his penance is purgatory or hell. Remember that the Protestantism that so concerned the Inquisition rejected the possibility of purgatory. And third, referring to the overarching problem of religious identity, Don Quixote compares the handwriting of scribes to that of Satan, and Sancho refers to his own master with suggestive hyperbole. I say that your worship is surely the devil himself, and that there is nothing you do not know. Now let's consider the letter that Don Quixote wants to write to Dulcinea. The first thing we notice is that thanks to the fact that Sancho has lost his ass, this will be much more than a letter. It will also be an asinine bill of exchange, Libranza Poyinesca. Further, instead of writing the letter on leaves of trees or on tablets of wax, Don Quixote recalls the memory booklet that belonged to Cardenio. Apparently no one wants to remember the escudos. Don Quixote suggests that Sancho can later copy it onto normal paper, but the squire objects, insisting on legal precision. But the bill must be signed, and thus, if it is transcribed, they'll say the signature is false, and I'll lose my donkeys. Regarding the asinine order, Don Quixote trusts the honesty of his niece. Regarding the letter to his beloved, he says that it does not matter if the writing is not his, because Dulcinea doesn't know how to read or write, and has never seen his handwriting because her parents keep her locked away. Here when Don Quixote names the parents of his beloved, Sancho is shocked to learn for the first time the true identity of Dulcinea. 
So Lorenzo Corchuelo's daughter is the Lady Dulcinea del Toboso, otherwise known as Aldonza Lorenzo. Don Quixote admits this to be true, adding that she is the one worthy of being queen of the entire universe. Curiously, however, what follows is a long demystification of the Hidalgo's beloved. Sancho knows her well, describing her in a way that reminds us of the manly Torralba chasing Lope Ruiz. She can toss a metal rod as well as the brawniest lad in the entire town. Oh, son of a bitch, but she's strong, and what a voice. I can tell you that one day she climbed to the top of the town's bell tower to call some shepherds that were in one of her father's plowed fields, and even though they were more than half a league away, they heard her just as if they were standing at the foot of the tower. <laughs>